Hi, it's Tim Hagen from Progress Coaching, and welcome to another episode of Coaching Conversations. And I wanted to make you aware of something very cool that we're doing on a subscription basis, and we'll put a link in each one of our episodes. But every Wednesday, we're going to be doing what we call an audio podcast workshop. That workshop will be roughly about 14 to maybe 20 minutes per episode with each month having the theme from a coaching model, using feedback strategically to coaching self-awareness, and so on. So if you could, look in the body or in the content description of each episode, and you will see a link where you can join this subscription. These are literally four workshops every month teaching specific strategies to address a particular area of workplace coaching uh, as it relates, again, to things like awareness, motivation, teamwork, and what have you. Here's the cool thing. It's only $10 per month, and each month you will get a handout that we will follow along with, so we also give you a tool for you to take notes as we go through each episode. We hope you'll check it out. Hi, everybody. It's Tim Hagen from Coaching Conversation training series podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, a friend of mine who's a member of our community, Linda Johnson. So I'm going to warn our listeners, this will not conform to conventional standards. Linda and I have never had a conventional conversation a day in our lives. But Linda's a a, a friend of Progress Coaching, has been a member of our community and really does some cool things in the leadership community. Hi, Linda, how are you? I'm fine, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Uh, Tell our audience a little bit about you and the type of work that you do. Sure. I work with organizations, um, municipal, public, private, around strengthening their leadership. And whether the leadership has to do with people who are newly in the C-suite, newly as commissioners, and particularly people who are trying to finally tackle the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I work very closely with them, with their teams, to come up with some kind of a, a real integrative strategy that's going to help move their organizations forward. Cool. And you actually just did a cool LinkedIn post uh, speaking directly with the church and some of the parallels with uh, the workplace. Walk us through that. Sure. I spent 15 years working um, part-time as part of the pastoral team of a church in New York City, in Queens, in one of the most multiracial churches in the most multiracial district um, uh, zip code of a very diverse city. And I realized in thinking it, you know, I had had kind of like a a dualism. I was thinking of the things I did there and the things I do in working with organizations. And I said, no, it's the same work. One of them I'm super steeped in, but it's the same work. So I was thinking of the parallels and I said, why don't I finally just write it down? So that's how that piece came to be. So what led you to using those comparisons? Because they're so similar and I think that we can learn. There are lessons on both sides. The lessons, there are so many, and I'll just give you a couple of them from the from the church side, <clears throat> pardon me, is that the, his, the thing about diversity is it's a fact. It's not something that's necessarily intentional. In hmm. New York City, you can get into a subway and you are in a diverse environment, right? You can walk down the street, you can um, just go next door and you're already stuck in diversity. That's not the same. You can open up a church and it'll be diverse as soon as the doors open, but it doesn't mean that it will be inclusive. It doesn't mean that the power will lie in the hands of people who are representing the larger body. And similarly, organizations that are struggling around diversity and inclusion have to make a distinction in their minds between a diversity that just happened, it was accidental, Mm -hmm. or something that has been nurtured. And then you still have to go to the next step of being intentional about making sure in your upper ranks that you're an inclusive organization, that everyone has a clear path to move up, to be promoted, to even be hired and invited in. That is a whole other story. Yeah. So what are some of the commonalities and differences as it relates with the minister ministries in the workplace? Sure. Um, One of the immediate uh, commonalities that comes to mind is the importance of the leader. Uh, I love the expression. I think it's Patrick Lencioni who says the leader goes first. If this is in the ideal world, it doesn't always happen at the very top. But if the person at the top makes a decision, we are going to make sure that we have not only a diverse um, uh, set of candidates for higher positions and, and representation, but that they are actually included in the decision making, then there's a 80% chance you're going to do well. 80%, not 100% because you might mm-hmm. have some roadblocks along the way. If the leader is lagging, 
even if everyone else below them is like, no, we're, we're into this, let's go for it. They're going to be a hold up and there's an 80% chance you will not be able to reach your goal. So I think that the number one is that the leader must make the commitment, but wherever you are, whatever level of leadership in whether in the secular or in the, the church world, if you go from your level down to where you have authority, you can still make a change. And for a significant mm -hmm. number of people. Ideally, the leader would go first. Um, the second thing I just want to mention, though, is the interesting thing I found, the experience that we had at this particular church uh, and what I see happening in the business world, which has to do with the fact that autonomy can be a route to equality. And what that means is that within the business world, you have employee resource groups or groups of whether it's, you know, all women or, or Black or Latinos or people with, with um, disabilities getting together. And they have their own formation within the organization and they're working to also you know, make the organization more inclusive. Our experience at the church, we were so committed to multiculturalism is like, we don't want all the, you know, all the Filipinos gathering and we don't want to have all the black people over here. And, we, and then we realized after you said, you know what? This is a good thing, you know, because what ends up happening is you're strengthening the feelings of the, the Indonesians or the people from Jamaica that I belong somewhere within this larger place that I also belong. The other thing that we found was interesting is that you can kind of go from country to country by visiting the gatherings of different groups. So that actually worked out well. So autonomy is really a route. It's a route, not the only, but it is a route to equality as well. So taking some of that in um, into context, what are some of the things that organizations can do to become more inclusive? The first thing they have to do is open a dialogue. And I think one of the biggest fears is I don't want to say anything. I've seen this from people in every sector. I don't want to say it. I had somebody practically whisper the word black when I was said, well, you said Joe. Which Joe? The tall one, the short one, the skinny one. He says, you know, he's black. Oh, <laughs> we have to stop that. We have to just, can we just have the conversation? Can we just say, yes, I do notice that you're white, Tim. It's nothing, it doesn't make me racist. I notice because I have eyes and glasses to help me out. Uh, can we start the conversation somewhere? And the easiest place to begin the conversation is to talk about yourself and your own experience and mm. to become familiar with that. I don't need to know everything about what it means to be an Irish American, although the fact that you speak, I think is Gaelic is fascinating to me, <laughs> but I do need to know who I am. I do need to know what makes me me so that we're both coming. We can help both bring something to the conversation. So that's like step number one. Uh, let's just get the conversation started. And you have to have a team and the team has to include people who are also stakeholders in this in this thing we're trying to build. Uh, and you have to also resource them with time, sometimes with even staff, but at least releasing staff um, to work on this together and to have input and influence in every level from the people who are doing the hiring, the people who are doing the promoting, the people who are doing the training, they all have to work together. Mm. So who makes, who makes up the team typically at one of your client sites? It could be somebody from the training department, as I mentioned, somebody from HR. Um, a lot of organizations have now um, diversity, equity, and inclusion teams. That would be the DEI teams. Sure. Someone from senior leadership, usually a couple of people from senior leadership, and then usually a couple of people who have been like kind of tooting the horn for this for years and are like, finally here, you know, we've got some place where you can, you know, you can give your two cents and you can be part of this process. So that's usually the kind of team. Sometimes you have people who are sent there because the boss said I have to be part, but I don't care about this. I don't know anything about it. I feel inadequate. What am I going to do here? You know, and, and it turns out, it turns out well, but you have to have that kind of cross functional as well as cross cultural team working together. Well, and you mentioned conversations. You and I, if we ever recorded some of our conversations, it would be quite interesting. But we've also been very, very comfortable having and exploring conversations of agreement, disagreement, right? Yeah. How do you help organizations become more comfortable? You said it starts with the conversation. How do you go about assisting your clients in becoming, let's be honest, comfortable with, with what most people think is pretty uncomfortable? Yeah. Well, you have to first develop a relationship and an actual genuine connection. That's usually not going to happen in the boardroom, although it can, but it usually is probably going to happen over lunch or, you know, the, the picnic in the park or someplace that's completely different. I mean, once we went on a staff 
uh, we were on a staff retreat and we went to see Spider-Man 3 from the, the original Spider-Man, you know, and it was, it was great, you know, it was, the movie was okay, but the bonding, the relationships that were developed, so you've got to get the heck out of the office and just start to relate on a human level, you know, and just develop the, the connection because then when we're trying to tackle this beast, we're not tackling it with strangers, you know? We're not having this conversation with, with people that we don't know. I'm having a conversation with a kid who also has a child on the on the softball team, you know? I'm having this conversation with that other person who also hates cooking as much as I do. So we have to, to, to start there. And there's so many wonderful exercises, just openers that we can do that just get to our human level. And I think even from the church background, that is, one of the things that I've seen break down walls between me and a Korean American intern who was working with me and we could not stand each other. And I called him into a meeting and was really prepared to throw furniture at him. It was that bad. <laughs> you, you know, I was serious. I was like, I will go to jail for this. Okay. But <laughs> in talking, you know, and through it, it got to a point where it touched on both of our humanity and who we are and the ways that we're broken as yeah. people, which was really, which really went deep. And we're both sitting there crying, going, oh, darn, I hate this. But it, it just broke something. We were able to then get to the other issues. And it just, it totally changed our relationship as well as, as kind of who we were on the inside. But you got to get out of that, I'm the boss, and you're the, no, no, we're, we're people. We have to start right. there. Then we can get into the other stuff. I think that's why you and I can talk so much. Do, do you think that organizations make the mistake of trying to tackle the beast too soon? There is no too soon. No, but what I'm saying is, do, do we tend to go and try to solve the diversity inclusion oh. issue before we get to know each other? Like, I, yeah. I see you as a black woman, you see me as a white man, and all of a sudden we're thrown in this room, and now we got to talk about diversity and inclusion. I, I don't know about your sons in the theater and the multicultural background, your church background, which we've gotten to know each other. Mm -hmm. Do you think sometimes organizations deal with this on those merits and forget to get people to get to know each other? I hear what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And that always crashes and burns um, the cart before the horse. And just to yeah. give you some uh, uh, some church parallels, there have been so many crashings and burnings and like, oh, we, we don't we don't have enough Asians in leadership. I know we'll put this person over the prayer meeting. <laughs> You know, right. why? Because they're the wrong person. You know, we're trying by doing these these uh, external things that people can see, but we haven't done the hard work, the internal work. So, yes, mm. we can start too soon, but you've got to do the internal work. That's why emotional intelligence. I know you've taken courses. I've taken courses. That's why it's such a big deal. Because yeah. you realize that the unhealth and the lack of intelligence, that's why so many things that could be um, accomplished are not getting accomplished, regardless of, of you know race or nationality. But if you don't have emotional health or emotional intelligence as a basis, good luck, Charlie. It's not going to happen. Okay, right. because all your stuff is going to start coming out all over the place. Right. So, uh, share with our audience the type of work that you do, and how does someone go about getting a hold of you? Sure, sure. I come to organizations or I'm invited to come and help them solve problems. The problems are often that we need to start a new strategic initiative. Again, it could be around the area of strengthening our or just kind of beginning from the ground level in terms of our diversity, our equity and inclusion efforts, solving problems around teams that are distrustful. That happens quite a bit. And there are many, many reasons that teams don't trust each other. Um, also helping to start organizations that are saying, well, we, we just have the bare bones. We don't really know. We think we know where we want to go. We don't know how to get there and work with them to really clarify their vision, clarify their mission. Even if the mission has changed, okay, well, mm -hmm. where are we going? How are we going to come up with a language that everybody understands? How are we going to have cascading communication to get our message across to everyone? So I really, I think um, one of my strengths is really helping people to um, kind of sharpen your vision, okay? Because I can kind of see what's going on that's not being said. So it's to help them, help them have language for it, sharpen their vision, and then come up with a step-by-step -step plan to get to their goal. Okay. So you can contact me through um, my, my, um, my, I'm sorry, my website, lindajohnsonleadership.com, or you can email me at linda at leadershipsolutions.biz, B-I-Z, um, and also through my LinkedIn account, Linda Johnson or Linda Drummond Johnson. And the article will be um, linked so you can read the article, which is posted on LinkedIn and then get in touch with me that way. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today. And we actually got through this being fairly serious, which is if anyone's ever witnessed our conversations, they're, they'd be very proud of us right now. So thanks again. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. Thank you for listening to another episode of Coaching Conversations by Tim Hagen and Progress Coaching. Now, our company is always coming out with new and innovative solutions to help leaders coach their employees. And recently, we just created a new service called Coach to You, where leaders can pick and choose topics and assign 7 to 21-day programs for employees to learn and, more importantly, apply actions and then reflect and share what they're going to do going forward as a result of the learning. It's called Coach to You. We're literally bringing coaching to your employees. If you're intrigued, we'll have a link in each one of our episodes where you can get more information. And again, thank you so much for listening to another episode.